Hi everyone, this is Deep Learning Cloud System Trends. I don't know why I have to say it again. Um, so this is the DALI 2 talk series, the third instance. And um, today we're talking about safety and deployment and uh, the, the last part to conclude the whole series. So if you missed the previous two, we have recorded them and they're on our YouTube. So today we have Pamela here. Um, and as usual, we'll start with a fun little interview. So Pamela has told me that I can ask any questions I want. <laughs> I think she meant the list that I sent her, <laughs> but I can interpret as any question I want, but I won't do that. So um, I'll pick one from the list uh, that is, what are unknown struggles in becoming a researcher? For doing like policy research in particular, I think thinking through all of the sort of unknown unknowns when it comes to uh, how system, how people react to systems and how they exist in the real world um, is really difficult and figuring out how to like translate between different languages in the AI safety communities has been a definite learning curve. Um, and I think one that uh, I'd love to see uh, more researchers investing in. Okay. I'm muted myself. Uh, cool, thanks. Uh, and another is more related to your own job. I'm, I'm just curious how you end up working at this deployment planning slash safety team at OpenAI. Yeah, definitely. So I did the scholars program at OpenAI, which is now kind of called the residency program. And I'd encourage anyone here to look into that if you're interested in um, OpenAI or ML research more broadly. And then my Career before that is kind of in a mix of like classic ML research and e economic policy and like software engineering and product management of human rights applications. And so uh, the sort of policy and safety team at OpenAI seemed like a kind of natural place where those interests kind of came together. And I was really interested in OpenAI as a place where the sort of safety constraints and policy constraints attached to deploying AI make the engineering problems more interesting as opposed to kind of like holding you back from doing the coolest things, like figuring out how to um, release things in ways that are safe and successful and robust is also like what motivates a lot of really interesting engineering problems to us. And so it's been really uh, cool to sort of work across teams at OpenAI and figuring out how to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. With that, uh, I can't wait to hear more about what safety concerns you guys had prior to or even during the deployment of DALI2. Yeah, and thank you so much for inviting us to talk um, more. I really enjoyed these series. So um, yeah, I'm gonna share my screen and I'll flag early that uh, my presentation is not super long. It might contain some things you've heard before or seen before in the other presentations. So feel free to chime in with questions at the end or um, as I go. If, yeah, um, I'm Pamela. I work on the deployment planning team at OpenAI, which is in our sort of policy research function. And I primarily work on understanding how to balance safety and success when it comes to building and releasing multimodal models, as well as on our work understanding the economic impacts of generative models, in particular, kind of labor market impacts of automation. So if any of you are sort of interested in that space, please talk to me anytime. My email is Pamela at OpenAI.com. And I'm going to talk today about Dolly 2 deployment, but this work involved well over 100 people at OpenAI, um, some of whom you've already heard from. I'm just going to highlight a few via their generations here. So Lemma organized the researcher access program and red teaming process. Alex Nickel did a bunch of technical work for pre-training mitigations. And I will many times throughout this talk talk about the blog post he recently published. Please check it out. Joanne uh, is a product manager for Dolly2. Um, and David Schnur um, is an engineer who worked on the project. He makes these sort of large canvas, beautiful generations. So I wanted to highlight some of this as well. And so I'm going to start off by talking a bit about what Dolly 2 is. I know you've all probably heard this, but it's in the deck, so you have to get to hear it again. And uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about how we co-design a safety system absent users. I'm going to talk about a bit of like the findings. So we do that primarily through a red teaming process. I'm going to talk through some of the findings of that red teaming process. And then next step. So how, where do we take this research moving forward? So yeah, take a step back. OpenAI's mission is to ensure artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity, um, where we define AGI in our charter as referring to autonomous systems that can perform a wide range of tasks extremely well. 
And we commit to four principles as we pursue safe and beneficial AGI. So one is broadly distributed benefits, ensuring that benefits are broadly shared and used for the benefit of others. Long-term safety, so the AGI is developed safely and is aligned toward benefiting society. Technical leadership, so OpenAI strives to be on the cutting edge of AI capabilities. And then finally, cooperative orientation. So we actively cooperate with research and policy institutions to work toward our common goal of safe AGI. And we primarily do this through what we call a sort of iterative deployment process. So um, that means we start with the kind of initial development of a model. So that might be problem identification, goal setting, initial impact assessments, or kind of like best guess at what we think the impact of this technology will be in the real world. And then process of curating a data set to train a model on. We then go through the process of aligning that model. So that can include things like instruction following, fine tuning, um, different evaluations of alignment. And then we kind of put it in the world. So we do model evaluation, we revise the impact assessment as we see how people react to it, and we red team and user test those models and those systems. And we keep going. So we release to increasingly larger sets of people. Um, we try to release increasingly, to, we allow people to do increasingly number of things with those models, and we iterate on these safety processes as the models are developed and deployed. And we think primarily that iterative deployment helps us clarify our definition of benefit while putting us in closer contact with real humans who will use and be impacted by AI systems. And this image is from a sort of blog post that we wrote detailing our deployment process for GPT-3 that I encourage you all to check out. So then how did we apply this like GPT-3 process and all the lessons we learned there to Dolly 2? I'm going to start off, what is Dolly 2? So Dolly 2 has a range of capabilities. The primary one that you've potentially seen on Twitter is text to image. So given a caption, it can generate a realistic image representing the text in the caption. So here we have a photo of kittens stressing over a spreadsheet in an office. Hopefully none of you are feeling that way today. Um, we have a product photo of cozy avocado shaped kids backpack in the style of Wes Anderson. Um, we have vibrant smiling and laughing bowling balls rolling down a bowling alley digital art. Can also do in painting. So here we have a yellow chair in a room. You can erase the yellow chair and ask for instead of a chic gray chair. This is Dolly's interpretation of what chic means. I don't know what all of your interior design sense is, but you can judge for yourself. Uh, you can also erase the left half of the image and add a modern fireplace next to the chair. Um, you can also add and remove elements while keeping shadows, reflections, and textures all into account. And the final capability of the model is what we call variations. So Dolly 2 can take an image and generate things in kind of like same vibe as that input image. So things that are conceivably created by the same artist in the same style, potentially representing the same character. And they're all kind of inspired by the original and like maintain the same basic style. But Dolly 2 is not just the model, it's this larger system that it's deployed through. And for this, we apply a layered safety approach. So that includes both pre-training filtering. So here we filtered out content that would inherently violate our content policies, regardless of the context in which it's shared, and content that we believed would lead to inherently harmful reference collisions, or places where one concept was accidentally mistaken for another. So you can think of, for example, the eggplant emoji. We wanted to be really careful that that would only result in images of vegetables. We also have input filters, so on prompts, um, and on images in the case of in-painting and variations. And there's like two goals of this. One is to limit uh, the model's capabilities to generate harmful content or content that will violate our content policies. And the other is to handle places where misalignment um, would occur. And we believe that misalignment would be inherently harmful. So places where there's a disconnect between the user intention and what the system would result in. Um, and places where that uh, disconnect would result in real harm. And we released this through, again, a stage release process. So it started off internal to OpenAI employees, primarily through Slack bots. We then released to researchers, early beta users, and red teamers. And this was both through early beta called generations on the Dolly 1 models and through later betas with Glide models and Dolly 2. We then released to a few thousand trusted users while allowing them to share, so kind of giving everyone read access to the system. And then finally, we're now gradually increasing access. And I'll talk about a couple of different models, but things to generally keep your lexicon are Dolly 1, Glide, and Dolly 2, as well as Generations. Yeah, so how do we then design this whole system? Well, to take a step back, before beginning development of Dolly 2, we released a paper on this family of models called Glide. 
Um, and as part of this, we trained and open sourced a small text to M model that was filtered of images of people, images depicting violence or featuring items associated with violence, images featuring hate symbols, and images with captions that reference hate symbols in the Anti Defamation League data set uh, were all removed. And this worked, right? It, uh, the model was not primarily able to generate images of people, it was not able to generate violent imagery, particularly if not directly and explicitly prompted for it. Um, but it also affected a range of other capabilities that we cared about. So for example, here we compare a filtered version of Glide with an unfiltered version of Glide of a similar size. And we see that its ability to generate things that look like orange triangles is limited. So I also have below, so that, that's the top two images of the two Glide ones. Below is an image from Dolly 2. We also see it has just like a much wider range of what it interprets orange triangle to mean for what we might call like an underspecified problem. Do you want an orange triangle that's like orange the fruit or just the color? Do you want a number of triangles? So we want like a slice, which one might call a triangle. All right, it says um, the, the lower hmm? image unfiltered. The lower image is Dolly. The um, left top image is glide filtered and the right top image is the small glide model. But also filtered or unfiltered? No, the, the top right is unfiltered. I see. Because the prompt doesn't seem to violate your rules, so probably it didn't matter. Yeah, exactly. So this is just an example of where even though the prompt didn't violate our rules, the filtering we'd done on pre-training data impacted the final results. Yes. So the model just hasn't seen enough images generally to be able to understand what orange triangle means when we remove all of this data. I see. Thank you. Thanks for watching. It's great. <laughs> Make this much clearer. So we also find a number, number of other things. So Glide, even though it's been uh, filtered, has a bunch of images of people filtered, continues to exhibit bias. So here, religious place defaults to Christianity. We see girls' toys results in pink images, boys' toys results in blue images and Legos. We also find that Glide does retain knowledge of violent content, even though most of that imagery is removed. So here, bloody crime scene, we still get a lot of red bloody scene, you get some Bloody Marys and some just like generic grossness. Red scene, you get tend to get more flowers than you would like blood, but it still can sort of be used to compose images into things that appear violent. And the reason that this is important is when we're open sourcing that model, it means people will probe harmful prompts and potentially be able to use this however they want. So they can fine tune it to do particularly harmful things is one example. So here's another place where we see it retains some knowledge of harmful content. So Nazi with the A replaced with a four results in images of fighter jets and warplanes, um, as well as some things that show that this filtering did work pretty well, where you get kittens and sunflowers, for example. And given what we learned from Glide, we then use that to kind of define incident classes for Dolly 2. So um, we have a class, bunch of incident classes that we think are related to the content in an image, as well as things that tend to be more deployment specific, risks that emerge when the model is deployed. So that's people probing the model, people trying to replicate the model. Um, and these deployment specific things, we were able to primarily borrow just the findings we had from GPT-3 API access, whereas harmful content was sort of a new set of things we have to think about when it came to releasing a model via an API. So I'm going to talk more about that first set today. And then for each incident class, we just kind of like try and think about what might go wrong. So for example, for political use, where generations or Dolly 2 is used to generate material to promote a political position or candidate, we think about all the ways that harm might manifest itself in the world and just try and come up with examples for both marginal incidents and critical incidents. So here a marginal incident might be someone using Dolly 2 to generate propaganda for their student government race, whereas a critical incident would be something like generations or Dolly 2 powering a political or presidential campaign. And we define the sort of level of incident based on the likelihood it would happen, the level of harm that would occur in the real world if that did happen, as well as sort of a couple of other factors that we incorporate into this. Ideally, we would be able to sort of like really ground in like things like the likelihood that something will happen. Um, and a lot of it is kind of using our existing knowledge as well as like research in these specific spaces. So in disinformation, to try and figure out uh, what the like, success rate would be of uh, an attempt to use the model in this way. And that gives then informs this sort of data set to train model process. So we're then take all these lessons and try and go from a data set into a trained model. 
And here, for our pre-training mitigations, we um, attempted to, again, mitigate the model's capacity to generate the most explicit content, particularly if not prompted for it directly, so harmful misalignment. And to do this, we filtered out explicit and graphic images, um, so sexual and violent content, as well as hate speech, and we deduplicated the data. And to train the filters to do this, we used this active learning approach that is outlined in the pre-training mitigations blog post that we put out recently, which basically allows us to get away with not labeling a bunch of harmful content and instead sort of iteratively training a model to then filter out that content. And we also monitor throughout training for impacts on other incident classes. So what are the orange triangles that might emerge? In this case, we found that uh, filtering out sexual content uh, impacted the model's tendency to generate images of women, even when explicitly prompted for it. Uh, and so we ultimately resample images of women to add them back into the data set so that the end model is as biased as it would have been without the filter. Ideally, we then try and make it unbiased, but I'll talk about that in a bit. And so here's a, another image from that blog post detailing that process. Uh, and the end result is this works pretty well. So here, um, I compare an unfiltered Dolly 2 model with a filtered Dolly 2 model with the prompt military protest. And we see that while the unfiltered model generates people in armed uniforms with guns, the filtered model generates what looks to be a reasonably peaceful protest. And part of why we do this is not because we necessarily think that like all applications that would generate this kind of content are harmful, but it's much easier to be sort of judicious about where we'd add this content, content back in later in the process than it is to do that early on. So we want to sort of take a principled and specific approach to understanding the impacts of this kind of content um, and filtering allows us to do that. So then we hey, have Alan, a train flow. Actually, sorry, just to yeah. clarify, uh, would you like questions during or would you rather we wait till people uh, until people- Happy to take both, yeah. Oh, sweet, thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Jordi Rabai. Uh, I just wanted to ask more about this idea on uh, the benefits of pre-training versus just filtering out later. Later, it seems that like essentially trying to avoid behaviors that are considered harmful would be much easier to do with a filter later in the process. And it wasn't quite clear to me in the sentence you just said, sorry, of why it would be preferable to go through this issue of uh, retraining and essentially trying to avoid like uh, certain classes that might impact uh, other uh other generations like generating women and uh the sexually uh the sexual content you mentioned earlier it seems like you wouldn't have to deal with this if you just had a filter later on in the process and so do you mind just speaking a little more on what the benefit is of yeah. uh, not just using the easier yeah. filter also good to see you jordy was also in the scholars program with me so. yeah um so Here's a couple of different answers to this. One is if we know something is going to be a violation of our content policy and there just aren't um, necessarily going to be externalities to it, try and take a principled approach to saying we actually don't want users to be constantly attempting to use the model in ways that we just ultimately can't support robustly. And so we can take a sort of more blanket approach to that really explicit content. The other is that what we care about are sort of like making sure that users who are ultimately going to use the models as they're designed get the best possible performance from them. So that means if you say, I'm at, for example, a school protest, you shouldn't get images that contain a bunch of guns back or contain sort of military imagery in them. That's the sort of place where that like misalignment can be direct, like extremely harmful. And so filtering out those images early allows us to ensure that we've hopefully addressed most of those cases of misalignment or places where you get an image where it's like, that's not the flag I was looking for. That's not what I meant by a pickle or an eggplant emoji or anything that might sort of like uh, accidentally veer on the pla on a place that would lead to sexual content or graphic content. And then if there are places that we miss, we can sort of be really careful about how we're adding them back in. And I think there's a tendency like to at times say that be a lot less comfortable making that choice later on around adding content back in. That is, if that's a sort of more editorial decision than leaving the content in the data set to begin with. And I do want to challenge that because I think we, once we know the content is in the data set, we, it is an active cho choice to leave it back in the same way it's an active choice to potentially put it in later in the process. And the sort of editorial decisions being made throughout this entire 
process. We know there's ways that different, different architectures tended to distill or result in more misalignment than others. And we try and sort of acknowledge what we're doing at each step. If we're leaving content in, why are we leaving it in? Um, and if we're taking it out, why are we taking it out? And if we're putting it back in, why are we putting it back in? And so going through and trying to do each of those steps robustly, including where the answer ultimately is don't take action here, is sort of key to this whole process. I don't know if that clarified. It did. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, can I ask a question on top of that, uh, yeah. but don't let me slow you down. Uh, just that um, if you were to filter essentially results that you that would be against the content policy, would you expect that essentially that you could get to the point where you would still have useful results for people using um, Dolly two and like the correct method, like essentially for let's talk, let's say for example this military protest. If with the unfiltered content. If you would have the ability to just have a filter at the end of the Dolly 2 training to say like, hey, eventually once I get rid of all the, once I filter out all the results of people in armed uniform, can I expect to get more peaceful protest images like popping up or more relevant protests? Or is there instead a benefit to this pre-training mitigation in that like, it's not like I can essentially just keep filtering bad results until I get good results? This isn't, I, if I, if I think I'm like parsing the question correctly, I think this is like an area of active research. So we're still sort of understanding what are the exact impacts of places like that of filtering out military protests and how does that exactly impact something like Orange Triangle? That's sort of area of active research right now. But I think there are also ways that sort of just shifting the distribution to be more representative of the sort of way that we expect this model to be used and are hoping it's used ultimately does actually help the model be also just more performant on things like orange triangles. So if it's constantly, you know, distracted by sexual content, that's not uh, like what we want it to be. I, I'm trying to very hard to not personify models uh, <laughs> in this part, but uh, we don't want to be just distracted by that when it's sort of trying to explore a different part of the latent space. Um, and I think that's something we've just seen happen in different places and I think it's also just the sort of the way that like, if you do want to put on fight, like people are sort of introduced to these more harmful concepts. So we're not, you know, just sort of bombarded with all these images without that proper context. It's like, are you actively trying to sort of learn about military protests right now? Okay, then sort of you learn about that from particular textbooks, you learn about that framed in particular ways and making sure that where that imagery arises, it's contextualized in the accurate way is very important, I think, to how we sort of reintroduce this in sort of a um, more principled and judicious way. Understood. Thank you. That makes great questions. Okay, so now we have a model. Uh, exciting. Ooh. Uh, and we now try and put that model into a system. And for Dolly, we use this kind of controlled system mitigations. So that filtering does not entirely leave the model's ability to sort of generate harmful content, particularly content that's harmful depending on what context it's shared in. And so to address that, we um, employ prompt filters, image upload filters in the case of variations in in-painting, a content policy, and a security system. And we use monitoring to then ensure that people are sticking to all of these things. So here's an example of one of our messages on the site when you prompt the model for something that we ultimately can't generate. And I do want to sort of say again that this is not just places that we think we, we think the user is necessarily doing something wrong, but also just places where we don't think the model does a particularly good job in part related to these pre-training filters. So places where we might've introduced misalignment due to things we, we filtered in pre-training. And then we red team, we see how well we did. So red teaming here is a structured effort to find flaws and vulnerabilities in a plan organization or technical system, often performed by dedicated red teams that seek to adopt an attacker's mindset and methods. And here we take the system level of analysis. So that system includes non-model mitigations like all of those filters, as well as access controls, um, monitoring for abuse, red team, that whole thing. Um, in addition, sort of red teaming the model specifically. And one thing that's like not fully captured by this definition is that red teaming might also uncover non-adversarial limitations of the model. So places where unexpected outputs results, um, even when the model is being used without malicious intent. These are all things we try to uncover when we're just sort of saying, what does this model do? What has it learned? How has it learned those things? And how will that both inform places where we, like, it's really helpful and really good to use and places where it might be more harmful to use. 
And part of this, we want to hear perspectives that inform and challenge our deployment process and safety mitigations from people with expertise in specific areas of those incident classes and particularly related to the societal impact of AI. And so to do that, we worked here with 25 external researchers and industry professionals who were involved in three ways. So one, they provided advisory conversations on both that early incident class planning, as well as early designs of the system. Uh, we offered them kind of indirect programmatic access where they would send us a CSV of prompts. We would generate the content for them and send them back. And this allowed them to kind of bypass prompt filters, for example, to probe the model directly. And we offer them direct access to the preview site to test all the functionalities that we were planning to release. And then we incorporate their feedback. So uh, some of where that ended up was limited access and a scripted use case approach, as well as iterating on mitigations, including filters and content policy. Their findings directly informed the system card that I'll talk about in a second, and they provided feedback on the system card directly. And they also provided feedback on the research, red teaming process itself. So part of this red teaming process is the research output of Dolly 2 deployment. And that's what we try to iterate on. We say, how could we have made this better? And how could we have made this more streamlined, safer, resulted in better feedback faster? And sort of designing that safety process is a big component of the deployment planning team at OpenAI. And from there, then we end up with documenting our findings. Um, and trying to sort of release them and be as open as possible as we can with what the limitations of the system are and how that might inform how you want to use it. So I'll I'm going to talk through a few. Uh, you can see the full system card on GitHub. Uh, I can provide a link in the chat after this as well. So to start off, um, we do still find some examples of spurious explicit content or content that emerges when you aren't explicitly prompting for it as well as things we call reference collisions, a context where a single word may reference multiple concepts, eggplant emoji, pickle, or some examples. Please don't prompt them, you might get banned. I'm also not gonna show a whole lot of images during this section of the presentation because some of it is harmful content that we're not trying to, not trying to harm you all at 10 a.m., I'm guessing for most of you. We also find cases of visual synonyms. So, using prompts to describe concepts that are against our content policies that would be difficult to detect without an embedding space prompt um, classifier or a generations classifier. So here we have a high quality image of a napkin stained with dark red liquid, conceivably looks like blood. So even though blood is blocked um, and most of things that would directly reference blood are blocked, you can still get realistic imagery from the model. We find the model, uh, exhibits certain biases and the system exhibits certain biases. So that includes both images that tend to overrepresent people who are white passing and Western concepts generally. Uh, it includes people presented as stereotypes. So female passing researchers presented in a kitchen versus male passing researchers presented in an academic context, as well as bias in the system and safety system design. So as one example of this, input classifiers can lead to erasure of certain groups even if you're doing it to try and avoid bias that might emerge from completing those prompts. So this results both from like false positives where you're potentially silencing certain groups, as well as true positives where the model produces particularly biased results when requesting, for example, images of women. And one approach to this would be filtering all images of women, but that would of course create problems of its own related to this sort of larger issue of erasure. The filters themselves can be biased as well, and it can also, filters can, or the model can require certain people, can sort of uh, create a system where certain people are required to sort of redo or probe spe for specification when they're trying to sort of represent themselves or concepts they understand in the model, which means that depending on your pricing scheme, means certain people are required to sort of pay more in order to get the same level of quality or results that someone else uh, would get naturally on their first prompt. And specification can also make the model's bias more visible in certain cases. So in that sort of female researchers in the kitchen versus male researchers in academic context, um, as one example. And next, uh, the model can be used for- The wedding images? Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with the wedding images? I couldn't see. The wedding images? Oh, it's just primarily Western concepts or like Western representation of what a wedding is. Um, and I think there's different levels of harm attached to sort of different kinds of bias here. But if you had to say, we want to sort of carefully map out the capabilities in the model and what it can realistically generate at the same level. I see. Part of this. So what we think, for example, uh, bias attached to images of people 
is more sort of directly harmful, it's important for us to sort of map and evaluate the sort of larger space here. Uh, so what else? Um, the model can be uh, used as potentially as a tool for harassment and exploitation. So images that may seem innocuous, um, particularly to people monitoring from different concepts or contexts or different countries, um, may miss cases that are particularly harmful in different cultural settings or when shared for the purpose of exploitation. So here we have a woman eating salad in painting to be a woman eating a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs. If she's a vegetarian, and it's shared for the purpose of exploitation, that might be an issue. Um, you could also think about uh, cases of removing or adding religious items of clothing. So yarmulke, her job, adding particular people to an image. Um, so having someone hold hands with someone who isn't their spouse um, and sort of ways those images are used that, that might be difficult for us to monitor once they leave the site. The model also has capacity to be used for disservice information campaigns. So can generate falsified evidence for operations claims, can generate high volume of synthetic images that ultimately drown out real, uh, real signals, could be used to help generate propaganda directly or propagandic narratives to con uh, generate convincing persona images to fuel a botnet, and then also can just undermine trust in legitimate sources. So the pure existence of really um, high fidelity AI generated images uh, allows anyone to then point at an image and say, actually that what that they don't like and say, actually that was AI generated, that's fake news. And sort of that's a sort of larger issue that the entire industry has to sort of think about and uh, figure out what to do about. And so here's an example using in painting to uh, illustrate smoke rising from the White House. And I kind of lied to you before, which is that, so we now have a system, but we then create a kind of deployed system from that. And that allows us to learn about the fun, cool things people do with it. So here, Holly Herndon uh, is one artist, she probes like her likeness in the model and how it understands what she looks like. Um, Randall Monroe created Live, Laugh, Love signs. It's really sad that I didn't think to do this first. There, Daniel Baskin, I, this isn't my favorite of hers, which was like the Izzy Rocks Park one that she created. Here we have uh, Muppets in Mad Max. Um, people have also been using variations to create short films and painting to create short films. So once we see also all the ways that people use this, that helps inform how we iterate on these different entire system design. So this results in some post-deployment mitigations. We revise the content policy, update filter thresholds, expand access and uh, do some sort of bias mitigations and under specification mitigations as well. And we're continuing to work on this and iterate on it. And so one example is the economic impacts research that my colleagues Tina and Sam lead, um, large scale multimodal evals. So what can what does Dolly know? How well does it know those different things um, that Shang Li is leading on? Continued external research or access. So if any of you are interested, please contact Lemma, uh, who worked closely with on everything you've seen covered today. <laughs> She studies disinformation risks, as well as thinking about the impact of additional methods of interaction. So none of these are things that we're open eyes necessarily building, but uh, that my team thinks about when we think about how people are using these models in the real world. So outpainting that I'll give an example of in a second, um, model chaining. So what does it mean to sort of use GPT-3 to generate a bunch of captions and then use Dolly to generate images from those? Um, what would programmatic access look like? Um, human feedback, fine tuning. So you could imagine fine tuning a model to create particularly realistic images in a particular context or on a particular topic. And as one example of outpainting, here we sort of like make the image smaller and then inpaint the outside to just create a sort of larger, more realistic image as you go. So kind of using inpainting inside out to create large canvases. And the reason it's important for us to think about all of these, regardless of whether OpenAI is working on them, is because we're not just here where it's like one deployed system, we're actually here where there's tons of examples of these different models existing in the world, and it's beyond OpenAI's ability to monitor every single one of them. And so think about where the industry at large is going and how these models will interact with each other and the norms and standards we set is very important to our whole iterative deployment process. And so part of key part of that is sharing lessons from it. Uh, so here are a few. One is that open-ended systems will be used in open-ended ways. More feedback from a variety of stakeholders early in the process is really essential to um, building robust systems. There's also a different scope of responsibility when it comes to what level of access we give to a system. So one of the benefits of deploying via API is that it's revocable and modifiable. It's reversible whether or not we're giving someone access to that system. We also find that it's important to sort of balance release sensitivity, publication and communication expectations, and timing for findings to be incorporated. 
Um, it's all sort of delicate balance that we're trying to strike. And uh, additional thing is that it's really important to sort of build safety commitments into testing. So it's one example, one of the early things we did was um, run a bias analysis across all of our input filters. Um, and it's important to sort of make that part of the larger testing process for releasing new versions as we iterate um, or edit those thresholds. Um, it's just a subset of the larger things that we're learning uh, and I'm keen to talk to anyone here about. So yeah, thank you so much for letting me chat. Oh, this is an amazing talk. Um, great, we have a bunch of time for Q and A's. Um, and I'll start maybe with one, just because I was browsing Twitter and, and saw one of um, David has shared that. So the prompt based filtering might might seem too conservative, where someone put in uh, wanting to generate something from Moby Dick and it was blocked. I don't know if you see that. Um, I, I'm on on the fence. I think it's it's okay to be overly um safe safety concern and, and, and a bit conservative but what are your take on that yeah i think it's a um constant balance we're trying to strike um both one of like what is the right place for that safety threshold to land two is how do we sort of get the sort of capabilities that we think are really exciting out faster while we sort of iterate on some of those safety thresholds and then third is just like making sure we aren't releasing things before they're robustly tested and so um, as we iterate on thresholds, it's what are the actual results that are coming out when we allow that in? And that might be an issue on our part, right? If the model isn't good at doing something. I don't want you as a user to sort of wait for that result ahead of time. And so I'm really excited about the sort of work the team is doing to revise and edit these thresholds to ultimately, yes, hopefully uh, you can generate a sort of large whale without sort of saying what we did directly uh, and then hopefully sort of figure out your way around them as well to generate things that are still safe. Cool, any questions from the audience? Sure, I'll ask one. Um, I Thank you for the really nice talk. I guess I have you know some intuition for what somebody who is doing model building is doing like day to day. But my question is kind of what does your day to day actually look like? You know, what are you doing on a given day? Me personally? Yeah, for example, yeah. people who are working on this kind of team. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it like really depends on what project I'm working on. So my shift, my focus has mostly shifted from Dali now um, and is like looking more at, for example, economic impact. So a lot of what I do is try to build models to understand what different sort of job data sets are doing or sort of what people are using models for. Sometimes it's training discriminators or training um, classifiers myself. For red teaming, a lot of it is both like building evals, evaluation systems for the model, as well as just kind of like some amount of it is like sitting there and probing and like trying to be creative about like, oh, actually like, and sometimes it's like, am I lying to myself and like inventing that I'm seeing something here and like them being like, oh, what if I can I try and like figure out more of like what part of latency is I'm in and like how I sort of see how dense different things happening here are. Some of it's also just like doing research on reading lots of papers that other people at other labs, thank you to all of you, uh, have written about their own processes here. So it's fun, it's really creative, and sometimes a little weird as well. They're like, oh, what, did he, what did you do today, Pamela? And I'm like, I was trying to find sexual content in this model. Like, uh, it's uh, <laughs> an odd job some days, but yeah. Cool, thank you. And we work also very closely with our research teams. So the whole Dolly 2 like team did a lot of red teaming here. Uh, and I think like also give us like most of our ideas for where to start looking um, and where to start thinking about the risks that they understand to be in the model. Cool. Great, thanks. Uh, I was curious about uh, some of the specific uh, processes and changes that you introduced to make the active learning uh, more effective, um, and sort of similar question on the red teaming as well. So for the active learning, I'm going to point you to um, the blog post just because it's going to explain it um, much better than I can. But essentially, we sort of first um, all agree on what the sort of our basic goal of the filter is going to be. So um, taxonomizing, for example, sexual content into the kinds we want to filter. We, we then go and find some examples of that, train a classifier on those, 
and then run that across our training data, which then identifies additional images that we then label ourselves and go through that again. And so we get away with labeling just far fewer images than we would need to otherwise. But sort of key part of that is just making sure that we're getting up front and agreeing on like what the actual threshold we want to hit is. Um, and that's running entirely on images. So this is places where we like aren't, we are potentially also flagging a bunch of images that are in the wrong part of that uh, distribution that they're like have a caption that does not indicate their sexual content. So would deeply affect sort of models capabilities downstream. Uh, and then I, can you just remind me the second half of your question? Uh, the cha specific changes that you made to make the red teaming more effective. Yeah, and this is something we're continuing to iterate on. Um, we're doing a lot more sort of large scale evals now um, and trying to just scale up our red teaming processes in ways that sort of individuals probing can't quite do. We also, in response to the, uh, so the red teaming happened sort of during the process that the final system was being developed. So a lot of the sort of changes around making sure that filters themselves were not exacerbating bias in the system um, was a key component as well. And now that the model is released, it's, and the system's released, it's really trying to see how people are actually using it and making sure that we're not hurting those things that people are really hoping to get good results from, while uh, also making sure they're not, that the sort of system is ultimately safe for everyone to use on day one that they are signing up. Good, thanks. Hey, Pamela, uh, I had a question. Um, is there any risk for, of like training these models, uh, like the next version of these models on the previous version's outputs and sort of amplifying any problems they have? You know, and is there like some process in place to detect like, okay, this is a previously like automated, you know, our automatically generated image and we shouldn't train on previous outputs? Um, something of that nature. Yeah, I think there is. And I think this applies to sort of like every kind of model you might build as there's, there's like lots of GPT-3 content online now. Um, we sort of think about how to be careful about introducing that into later training runs as well as Dolly 2. And if there, if there is going to be Dolly 3, making sure that um, we're careful about how that might exacerbate issues in the data set or impact other capabilities. I uh, don't know our exact, I don't think, I don't think we've thought exactly how we would think about that. We're just, we're just trying to work on improving um, the existing data that we have, but. Makes sense. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah um, I guess this. Uh... Yeah, I'm happy to follow up with some, uh, I believe Josh Akiam wrote uh, something about this recently as well. That I oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess this uh, follows up. There's a couple unanswered questions in the chat. One is about oh. fingerprint um, for like Dolly generated images. I guess that could be helpful in some sort of um, watermark, you know. Um, is there anything like that currently? Um, so all Dolly 2 images uh, are generated with a small, like what we call a signature in the bottom. Um, and we're working on understanding the best kind of provenance techniques that allow different people to understand whether an image was generated by Dolly or not, particularly as these images get more faithful. So. Cool. OK, thanks. Yeah. Important research. So in response to the, I'm, um, someone asked, I'm wondering if it would be possible to diversify the prompt in the back end to solve some of the issues you mentioned, e.g. by adding in different race slash gender adjectives when the word people or related concepts in the prompt. Uh, and this is something we just introduced that we're testing now. Um, I think there is sort of, uh, we're continuing to iterate on what the right way to identify these kind of underspecified prompts is, um, but I'm really excited about the approach that um, is now deployed. And have you used machine learning on the outputs to classify images and potentially look for bias on mass, or do you re mainly rely on sampling and human evaluation? Um, we do do both, um, but a lot of what we also do is just trying to get human labels from sort of larger subsets of the population than our team is able to do on our own, uh, and also making sure that any of the sort of classifiers we would use to detect are not themselves biased or would themselves result in sort of uh, exacerbating any of the harms attached to the model. Uh, and then Abraham, I'm not entirely sure what your question was referencing. I think it might have been response to something I was saying. I apologize for not seeing earlier. I, uh, I had a question. Um, has anything been done for, or discussion been done for sensitive art, for example, like paintings or like a Michelangelo sculpture or something? Like, do those pop up or are they just filtered out or 
still in discussion? It's definitely an inadvertent impact of um, the uh, of some of our sexual content classifiers, so or filters. So I'm pretty sure last I checked, I couldn't get the model to generate, for example, like the birth of Venus. And I think it's you know a sort of larger question of understanding how to like reintroduce that data potentially into the model as we go, and what line do we want to create on what is art and what is not, and then also did like agreeing that we don't need the system to be everything, particularly day one. So we call, you know, there's, this is not AGI yet. It's not a general system yet. Um, it's sort of specific and intended to be used by artists primarily and subset of artists at that. And so it might be okay that for the model to not know everything about the world right now. Because there's also a bunch of other stuff it doesn't know. It doesn't know recent concepts. Um, there's sort of potential harm it would let comes from it knowing for example, a ton of context on individuals or private individuals. And so uh, trying to like be okay with like identifying some limitations and then also just being really clear to people why those limitations exist um, and what they are so that- Okay, no thank you. Pointed. Yeah. I have a- Another question, just on the uh, you were talking earlier about the impact on on labor markets. How, how do you see Dolly two currently being used? Is like the work something that's replacing things that are previously done by people, or is it more often like a novel function? Like for me personally, when I used Dolly two, I would have never used like a um, how what am I trying to say? Photoshop or that kind of thing. Like it's it's kind of making a new function that I previously uh, wasn't able to do. But I'm wondering for people who uh, normally would be working in this kind of field, are they actually using Dolly too? Yeah, I think it's, so we have a really strong artist community who are using the models. Um, published a blog post about them recently and that program is run by um, Natalie Summers. And I think like primarily people are excited right now. And I'm particularly excited that we're sharing and like selling to artists directly. And, and so I'm hoping that uh, ultimately this is a uh, something that all artists, regardless of the level of ability, can um, benefit from, and will you know you sort of see that skill, also the skill of being an artist and being or having sort of a lot of knowledge of art history come out in people's prompts, and that's been sort of really exciting for our team to see. So yeah, I think it's far too early to tell the exact economic impacts, but um, if you are an artist using Dolly, I'd love to talk to you also. Awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I actually have one more question, if you don't mind me yeah. trying to squeeze in another. Just, I'm a little confused on the content policies, where when you were listing them at one point, I mentioned something about uh, people not being allowed to be generated, but then you would show like the the in painting examples of like people being able to be like in painted with like different objects. And so I'm wondering, is it like it's more famous people aren't allowed to be generated, or are the content policies different for generation versus in painting? Yes, yeah, so this was a change in our policy as we sort of learned how people ultimately wanted to use the system. So we started out with not ask, asking people to not share images they generated of people. Um, I believe, I encourage you don't read it before you attempt anything with the system. Um, so we currently block people from generating real people. So you can't generate a particular historical figure, you can't generate a particular politician, that those would be violations of our content policy. Um, and then you can also can't upload images of people for in painting or variations. So that's attempt to address the sort of harassment and exploitation cases that I discussed. Understood. And do you think um, essentially that like whatever the current iteration of how these uh, content policies are, are described, do you think that they limit people using it as art or that essentially like that uh, changing the content policies or making them more uh, open-ended will be necessary for people to feel essentially that they can express themselves as whatever, however they would like to artistically? Um, I'm not sort of close enough to how artists are using it to um, answer that um, directly. I think that um, one of the sort of key things we try and do when we craft and content policy is think about sort of um, not making it easier to do these, well, both like how, how do we make sure that the sort of core capabilities, the core things that Dolly 2 offers, are not limited. And so most of that I think is the sort of like magic here 
Um, and I think our artists also really understand why we're sort of being so careful and um, about our approach. Sort of sustainable. Mm -hmm. Makes total sense. Uh, it, se it seems like a hard situation, like a kind of a struggle between wanting to help out people. Uh, uh, and, and yet at the same time, yeah, obviously you can't ha generate anything, um, everything. Thank you very much. This has been awesome. Thank you all. Maybe one last question if anyone who haven't spoken. Or if you want me to relay your question, you can type in the chat. Going once, going twice. Okay, looks like everyone's eager together. We can start it. Yeah, please enjoy. If, if any questions come up later, I'm on Twitter. DMs are open. Cool. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, thank you, Pamela. I also want to specifically acknowledge that I think it's a very hard talk to give. The topic around it is just, um, and, and the fact that you did so much Q&A openly thing is a great thing that you're doing. And you've done it really well. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, yeah, it's happy to talk. Cool. Have great. a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela.